Hi. <laughs> Earlier this year, I was in Australia for the first time, actually. I visited the University of Western Australia in Perth, and one of my colleagues there told me something, um, something funny, I think, about the Australian national anthem. He said that basically no one there knows the lyrics. I think this is hilarious. Just imagine you're at some occasion, some celebration, and you're supposed to feel really patriotic, and they play the hymn, and you want to sing along, and you can't because you don't know the words. And people are not embarrassed about this. They just think it's funny, and I agree. I think it's hilarious. So I asked him, why? Why do people not know the words? And he said, you just have to look at it. You will immediately see why people don't know the words. So let's have a look. These are the words of the Australian National Anthem. I'm not going to read them to you, and I'm also not going to sing the anthem to you. Let's just notice that there is just one line that repeats itself. In joyful strains, then let us sing Advance Australia Fair. Everything else, there's no repetition, so many different lines. How on earth are you supposed to remember all that? Let's look at a different song. Fly, Robin, Fly. Here are the lyrics of Fly, Robin, Fly. Fly, Robin, Fly. Fly, Robin, fly. Fly, Robin, fly. Up, up to the sky. And then you repeat that a lot, and that's the whole song. That's easy to remember, right? And actually, you should look at the video on YouTube. It's, it's really funny with the dancing, and then also you can convince yourselves that I'm not lying. These are all the words. Now let's translate this to something different. Let's describe the structure of mosaics on the floor. This is the first example. Lots of blue little tiles. We see three different shades of blue. The tiles all have the same size. And now imagine you want to describe to someone what this pattern looks like. Describing this is a little bit like describing the lyrics of the Australian national anthem. There's no pattern, no repetition. How are you ever going to describe this? You have to describe the position of every single tile, the color that it has, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, it will take forever. Here's something that resembles a little bit more the lyrics of Fly, Robin, Fly. A chessboard pattern. Imagine you're standing on a black tile. In front of you, you see a white tile. On the left, on the right, behind you, Diagonally, you will see more black tiles. It's very easy to describe what is happening there. If you turn around 90 degrees, it looks the same. If you turn around the other way for 90 degrees, again, it looks the same. So there is a lot of regularity, a lot of repetition, a lot of symmetry. There is rotational symmetry, and also there are reflection axes in this pattern. And this is why it's so easy to describe this mosaic. This is a lot more like fly, robin, fly. And this also works with more complex structures. So here are two pictures of snowflakes. And again, you see symmetry exhibited. You see six different rotations that you can do, and also six different reflection axes. And in fact, you can use this symmetry to distinguish between real snowflakes and fake snowflakes that sometimes you see for Christmas decoration. They will have an eightfold rotational symmetry, and that's not real. And also, there are so many different snowflakes, they are all individual, but they all have this symmetry in common. And there is something else, namely the benzene molecule, that exhibits the same kind of symmetry. I chose this picture because it beautifully shows the, um, the pi orbital clouds of the delocalized electrons. That's the violet clouds that you see. And if you want to do calculations, for example, if you want to calculate energy levels of electrons, then usually you would have to solve lots of differential equations. But you can make your life a little bit easier by using the symmetry of this molecule. And this works also in 3D. Now we look at crystals. So this is zinc oxide. 
and on the next picture we see magnesium oxide. And there you see a big regularity again. If you describe a little piece of the crystal, then you can say, well, the rest is just repetition and symmetry. And this way you can very easily describe the structure of the whole crystal. And there is research here in Halle going on that uses symmetry of crystals to do calculations. These pictures are from Matthias Geilufer, for example, who did work like this in physics here in Halle. Now we come to viruses. This is a picture of a model of a virus that also exhibits symmetry. If you look at the middle, then you see this point where you have something regular around it. If you turn it five times, it will look the same again. So again, you have rotational symmetry that you can spot right there in the middle. And I would like to talk about viruses and about the regularity that they exhibit a little bit more. Because I think it's not clear, and also it was not clear to biologists when this research started, why viruses look like this. Why should they be um, of this spherical shape? Why should they exhibit so much symmetry? What's the reason? So in the beginning, and I would say it started in the 50s maybe with the first models, in the beginning people looked at models for viruses that were icosahedral. So you have a lot of triangles put together. And then things became more complex, and we will come back to that in a little moment. But before we do, let us just quickly remind ourselves what a virus looks like and what the building blocks are. So, first of all, inside, you have the most important bit, namely the genomic information. There you have the information that describes the structure of the virus, and this is essential for reproduction. So that's the information that needs to be copied, copied so that the virus can reproduce itself. And it's better if it works quickly. So this information should be read quickly, it should be understood quickly, and the new viruses should be built quickly. Then around that, to protect the genomic information, you have so-called capsid containers. They are built from protein, and they protect the important genomic information within. And then sometimes you have some additional hull around these capsid containers. They depend, for example, on the environment in which the viruses live. Live, sorry. That's a model that looks a bit more 3D. It's very beautiful, I think. The, disease, the diseases, I should say, because there are several attached to it, are not that pretty. pretty. This is a um, human herpes virus. There are a bunch of them, and this is type 8. And I'm showing this because you can see a lot of detail in the structure on the surface. But the little red triangle also exhibits the basic triangular shape that was used to model the surface. This is taken from a research article from 2000, this picture. So these models are used in actual research on viruses. And I would like to now um, explain a little bit how symmetry enters the picture. So let's come back to the picture from earlier. In the first model, the yellow one, you have the icosahedron. So you have triangles to cover the surface. And then the orange one still has triangles, but more of them. And then things become more complicated, more complex. This is because there have been classes of viruses that just could not be explained with the models that were there at the time. So things developed from the 50s with the first models by Crick and Watson through the 60s with some more um, elaborate models. And then something happened, or someone happened, I should say. Raidun Tvaro came along with her team. And they used something completely different for the surfaces of the viruses, and that was the key to understanding more complex classes of viruses. They used Penrose tilings, aperiodic tilings of the surface that can be used to cover the surface of a virus model. So there are lots of things to be learned from this. First of all, I should start um, by saying that um, Tvarok's new approach made it possible to have a deeper understanding of viruses, not just what they look like, but also how they work. Her models make it possible to link changes in structure of a virus to changes in function. And this could be key to understanding how, not just how the viruses work, but also how they can be fought. 
And in particular, when the viruses have a very high reproduction rate, so there's a lot of mutation in very short time, then it might be crucial to see changes in function, namely changes in structure, very quickly. That makes it easier to fight whatever disease they are causing. And also, I think, I think there's another lesson to learn, and that has to do with the research on Penrose tilings that was done, for example, during the 70s. In fact, people have been studying aperiodic tilings before, but then Penrose tilings came along, and at the time, I'm not sure whether people thought about immediate applications. And maybe that's the lesson that is to be learned here. Very often, funding for research is linked to immediate applications. Maybe there should be an immediate way to make money out of the results. Why? Why shouldn't people just do research on topics they find important and fascinating? And then they can spend time and energy and they will have fun working on it and then they will find great things and they will prove great results. And who knows, maybe applications will come along a lot later. Who would have thought that Penrose tilings lead to research that might save lives one day? Who would have thought? So, to wrap it up, in the concepts that I explained, symmetry is used, for example, to analyze complex structures and to understand them better. For example, with viruses, symmetry was used to explain how a very small amount of genomic information can capture the whole information about the structure of a virus that you need to reproduce it. If there is a lot of symmetry, then it's easy to capture the information on a very tiny um, bit of room, as we saw with the lyrics of Fly Robin Fly. If there is a lot of repetition, a lot of regularity, then you need very little space. And that's the secret of viruses, of these viruses anyway. Moreover, symmetry can be used to understand self-organization, for example, of molecules that self-organize when they are in a film, for example, on some surface. And then if you understand the symmetry properties, you can understand how their behavior changes if you change their environment. For example, if you change the temperature or the liquidity of the gel or something similar. And also, symmetry is used to reduce the complexity of calculations. We have seen this for calculations for energy levels of electrons. That's an example I talked about briefly. But also, some of my research is about this. We use symmetry to make algorithms faster. A lot faster, actually. So. The way I wanted to talk about symmetry today was I wanted to discuss with you that they can be viewed as a way to reduce complexity and also to compress data. Before we finish, who remembers the lyrics of the Australian National Anthem? Who remembers the lyrics of Fly, Robin, Fly? Ah, that's a lot of people. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>